All right. Okay. So. Okay. With that, uh, welcome everyone to one more edition of our MRL Central Research Facilities webinar series. Uh, very happy to have everyone join us again today. Uh, my name is Mauro Sardella. I'm the director of the shared facilities here at the University of Illinois Materials Research Laboratory. Our shared facilities instrumentation laboratories uh, have been open since more than a week now. Uh, and uh, access to trained users is fully granted at this point. We are providing some training, uh, mostly using video conferencing and social distance at this point but we hope to, to open for full training of new users on July uh, 13th. So it's coming up soon. So for you guys that are new to this interface, at this webinar, please use the chat window, the chat box that you see at the bottom of your screen to enter your questions. We'll address all of them at the end of the talk. All the presentations in this series uh, are being recorded and the video is being posted both in our YouTube channel and also in the webinar uh, website, which is you see listed there, Go Illinois ETU MRL webinars. Uh, our YouTube channel also has some other info, uh, useful material for you in terms of training, instrumentation and so on. Encourage you to take a look on that. You can find all the, the previous presentations we have had in this series, uh, including presentations of more basic aspects of TM, SCM, uh, analytical SCM, and last week we had one on biological uh, analysis of bio biological materials by electron microscopy as well. Everything over there, if you head to YouTube and look for MRL facilities, you'll find our channel there. Uh, the slides today uh, might be available to in PDF form, you can contact CQ, the presenter, directly on that. So for the coming weeks, uh, CQ, if you move to the next slide, please, you have an exciting lineup. Again, we will be running this series all the way until mid of August. Next week is Dr. Julio Soares, our guru in optical microscopy, optical characterization here in the MRL. Uh, if you ever want to know all the ins and outs about FTIR, ellipsometry, Raman, so don't miss the presentation next week. Followed by that, we're going to have nanomechanics and AFM, total new presentation by Jessica, Dr. Jessica Spear. And then after that, a uh, talk uh, by Dr. Juan Lopez on basics of small angle X-ray scattering. And we have a lineup that goes on like until middle of August. Uh, okay, today it's my pleasure to introduce the presenter, which is Dr. Shang Chiang Cheng. We fondly call him CQ, it's an abbreviation. He received his PhD in materials physics and chemistry from the Chinese Academy of Science in 2004. He then joined the National Center of Electron Microscopy in Beijing as a research staff. So then after that, CQ moved to Europe and became a researcher in the, at the Netherlands Materials Innovation Institute. From Holland, he moved to US and then first he got, he, he assumed, an, uh, he took an academic position at John Hopkins University in the Hopkins Extreme Materials Institute. And after that, went to the Northwestern University as part of the Nuance Facility Center. Since 2014, uh, CQ joined the MRL, is now a senior research scientist in, electron, in the electron microscopy core of the MRL. His expertise is in physical metallurgy, nanomechanics, thin film depositions, materials behavior under extreme conditions, in situ TM, and related instrumentation, including SCM as well. He has published more than 40 research papers, and he has been cited over more than 2,000 times. So CQ, thank you very much for taking the time to put in this presentation together. We appreciate you doing this. Uh, this is a topic that actually goes one notch beyond what we presented a few weeks ago in terms of TM. Now he's going to focus on chemical analysis. So with that, CQ, welcome. And uh, you, I'll give you the mic and the floor now. Thank you. Okay, can you hear me well? Yes. Okay, thank you, Mauro. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. 
today I'm going to talk about analytical TEM and STEM. So this is a follow-up of a recent seminars, and especially a seminar given by Dr. Wasek Zweig a few weeks ago on the basics of TEM and STEM. So in this seminar today, I'm going to focus on the analytical capabilities, especially on the chemical analysis with TEM and STEM. So the advantage of using TEM as a platform doing elemental analysis is the super high spatial resolution we can get. You probably have seen this chart many times. In here, we have both imaging techniques and analytical techniques based on TEM and STEM. So they are extending all the way to the left on the chart. So meaning the best spatial resolution among all the techniques. So nowadays, the imaging uh, at atomic resolution is becoming a routine with TEM and STEM. So analytical capabilities are also catching up and are able to provide us chemical information down to a very small scale if you have a, a suitable sample. So basically you can identify the elements, quantify their concentration, determine their chemical states in some cases, and mapping out their distribution with high spatial resolution. So now let's take a look what kind of signals we can use for chemical analysis. So in TEM, we have a high energy electron heating a thin sample, generating all kinds of signals. So some transmitted electrons are elastically scattered to high angles. So we can use those electrons for imaging and diffraction. Some other electrons are inelastic scattered and pass, an, pass energy to the atoms. So, and now carry the elemental information. So we can use them for energy loss spectroscopy. It also generates uh, characteristic X-rays, so which we can use for EDS analysis. So in my presentation today, I will briefly talk about uh, imaging techniques that are able, uh, that are capable of identifying different elements in, in a given sample in some cases. So then I will spend time uh, elaborating on the spectroscopy-based techniques like EDS and EOS. So electrons scattered to different angles carry different, uh, different information. So we can collect different portion of the electrons to form uh, an image. So like broad field image or ABF, uh, annular dark field image and high angle annular dark field image. They carry all different informations. So or if you have a pixelated detector, you can collect all these signals as a diffraction pattern. And then you can do post-processing later. So then you, generate, you can generate any kind of these images later when you have this big data set. So here I want to highlight the Hadiff imaging, Hadiff stem imaging techniques. The high, Hadiff stem means high angle annular dark field stem imaging. So the high angle here means uh, uh, larger than 50 millirad. It's not that huge, it's only about 2.86 degrees. So in this way, the contrast uh, obtained by using those images are proportional to the Z squared. Z is the atomic number. So this kind of image, we also call them a, a Z contrast image. Sorry. Um, so if your sample has multiple elements and there is a significant difference between the Z numbers, you may be able to identify them by using the Z contrast imaging. Here are two examples. So the first example is uh, STO uh, strontium titanate lattice. So the heavier strontium atoms are brighter and the lighter titanium atoms are darker. So the other example is catalyst nanoparticle. A heavier element platinum was used to decorate a lighter element copper. So you can see clearly where those heavy elements atoms are located, they are brighter. On the particle. So this is great. However, in the STO case, we are missing oxygen atoms. Oxygen is too light. Remember that the contrast is pro proportional to Z squared, so the weak signal from oxygen just got covered under the strong glare of the heavy elements. So recently, there's another imaging technique called IDPC developed. So this technique is better for resolving lighter elements. IDPC means integrated differential phase contrast. It is also a dark field stem imaging technique, but requires a segmented 
uh, ADF detector for stem imaging. So basically, if you have a very tiny electrical or magnetic field in your sample, even uh, induced by atomic columns, uh, so this kind of potential or electrical field will deflect the electron beam very slightly. So the segmented detector could measure the intensity difference between the opposing segments. So then uh, we can generate a vector image showing the direction and the strength of the field in the sample. This kind of image is called the diffraction of differential phase contrast. So then we can get IDPC, uh, basically by integrating the vector image in both X and Y directions into a scalar image. So this kind of image, uh, the contrast scales linearly with Z, not squared, supposedly it's a uh, little bit more friendly with the light elements. So the detailed procedure of generating IDPC image is demonstrated over here. So we have four uh, segments in the, in the ADF detector, we got four images for each, uh, you know, for using four, detect, four segments. So then when we do the, uh, math, we do the subtraction we, uh, between the uh, opposing uh, segments, we get two IDPC image, uh, there's a vector image. And then we integrate the X and Y direction, you get a scalar image in, um, um, with magnitude showing as a, as a contrast. Then we get the IDPC image. Here are the, are the two examples for IDPC imaging. The example on the left is STO again. So in the IDPC image, we can see clearly the oxygen atoms, which is yellow here. Uh, so oxygen atoms, however, we can see in the Hadith image. So the other example is gallium nitride in 211 direction. We can see both gallium dumbbells and, and nitrogen dumbbells very clearly. However, in the Hadith image, we can see the gallium atoms only. So for the imaging method to identify the elements, you need to know what elements are in there already. So we also need a reasonable difference between the Z numbers of different elements, but this is often not the case. So also imaging light elements is still challenging. So in the following section, I'm going to talk about the spectroscopy based method. Let's br br briefly review the electron transition caused by an incident electron. So we have an incoming electron impinging an atom. So where the incident electrons uh, has enough energy, it could knock out the inner shell electron. So we say the, the, item, the atom is ionized. So the ionized atom is not stable, and the outer shell electron will jump into the hole left by the ejected electron. So the energy difference is released by a X-ray photon. At the same time, the incident electron loses energy and become an uh, energy loss electron. So both the X-ray photon and the energy loss electron can carry the information of the atom. So therefore, we can use them for chemical analysis. So by using the two types of signals, we can do XEDS and EOS spectroscopy. At the same time, when we do the imaging. For EOS, this is possible because it only uses electrons that pass through the central hole of the annual dark field detector. So we can do spectrum imaging. We collect the full spectrum at each pixel of the digital image. In this way, we get a 3D data set. The X, Y plane of the data set is the image. The Z direction is the energy of the spectrum, either EDS or EOS. So the advantage of doing uh, spectrum imaging is that you can always do the post-processing later. So you can extract the spectrum from any pixel or a bunch of pixels or any area in the XY plane. You can also slice the data set in the energy axis. So then you can, get a ge you can generate a map. So the map is associated with the signal carrying that char characteristic energy only. So not only the processing of the data set, for the building of the 3D data set, we can also have two different ways. So first and most important way, most commonly used uh, method is the uh, STEM, STEM method. Basically, um, 
he collects the data, the data set pixel by pixel. So this, you do this when you have a STEM imaging mode available. So this is for both EDS and EOS. However, it's pretty uh, common that the TEM doesn't have a STEM mode, but it's still equipped with an energy filter. In this case, we can build the data set vertically, that is energy layer by energy layer. However, you, you need to do this uh, using many layers, each, each layer using very small energy vendors. So let's discuss a little bit EDS first. So here I want to do some comparison between SEM EDS and TEM EDS. So in SEM EDS, the spatial resolution is mostly limited to sub-micron level. So that is because the interaction volume is relatively big. So the TEM EDS, because of the sample is extremely thin, there's not much chance for the electron beam to broaden before the electrons exit the sample. So this is a broadening uh, equation describing the uh, broadening behavior in the uh, TEM sample. You can see the thickness plays the major effect. And also another good thing is the beam energy. So we use higher beam energy in TEM, but um, good thing is from this equation, you see the beam broadening is inversely proportional to the beam energy. So the high energy we use in TEM is always good for the reducing the interaction volume. So this is opposite to SEM EDS case. So thin sample is good for the spatial resolution. However, it's also a problem. So thin sample doesn't generate uh, a lot of X-rays easily. However, there has been significant uh, advances in TEM EDS in the past decade or so. So to compensate this problem. So this includes the advances in TEM and STEM itself, as well as the advances in the EDS instrumentation. So from the EDS technique itself, from the TEM instrument, uh, uh, instrumentation itself, nowadays we have better electron source available. It pro provides us the better brightness and more better stability. Also in higher end TEM, we have aberration characters available. So these characters are not only good for the spatial resolution, it's also good for the um, improving the brightness of the probe. Also in higher end TEM, we have monochromator available like Thames Z of our lab. So it's not only good for reducing the chromatic aberration, it's also very convenient for uh, adjusting the probe current very, uh, very easily without causing any aberrations. And also we have better design, better mechanical and thermal stability like constant power lines in Thames Z. That's very good for reducing thermal drift of the sample and electron uh, beam. And drift correction software is doing better jobs uh, these days. And also from the EDS instrumentation uh, point of view, nowadays we have a large solid angle SDD detectors available, uh, it's more common for high throughput mapping. So for example, the SuperX EDS detector system or a Thames Z system, uh, it has four uh, large area detectors. It provides a large solid angle of 0.7 steel radian. It allows about 5% of the emitted X-rays to be analyzed and collected. Also, it's windowless detector, so it's better for detecting the light, um, the low energy X-rays from light elements. So all these advances will help us our, for our EDS analysis. So this is an example of high throughput elemental mapping by using TEM EDS. So it is an Intel CPU processor. It is, it is a cross-sectional STEM imaging and EDS mapping. So we can map a large area like this in a matter of about 10 minutes or so. So with excellent signal to noise ratio. So the next example is the EDS mapping of some nanoparticles. So these nanoparticles are extremely small. If you look at the scale bar, it's about five nanometer over here. So in, in old days, this, is, this was very, uh, almost impossible to do. You can see here, we got a pretty, pretty clean map with pretty high signal to noise ratio. It also takes only about 10 minutes or so. 
So this is a, this example is STO again. I'm highlighting here the elemental mapping of individual columns of atoms. So the um, the co the atoms in red are strontium, the green is titanium, and the blue is oxygen. So the map of oxygen is pretty remarkable considering its low atomic number. So this one is gallium arsenide. Uh, arsenide. So you can see both the image and the EDS mapping clearly show the gallium arsenide, uh, gallium and arsenic dumbbells. Gallium and arsen arsenic atoms here are only about 1.4 angstrom apart. So I also want to point out that the computer algorithms nowadays are doing better jobs uh, too. We don't see a lot of information from the raw uh, map. However, if you apply a digital filter, you can reduce the, remove the um, noisy background. Now you get very clear, very clean elemental map. So I see uh, uh, STEM EDS is pretty cool producing colorful images of elements at extremely high resolution. However, there's also limitations to this technique. So first, there's unwanted X-rays generated, including those generated by the uh, forwards, forward and backward scattered high energy electrons at the upper and lower pole pieces. There are also electrons uh, and X-rays coming from your sample, but not exactly from an area of interest. So the collection efficiency is still pretty low, and the challenging of uh, the challenge for light elements is still there. So it's relatively it has relatively relatively poor energy resolution. Uh, if you look at the collection efficiency, X-ray collection efficiency is very low. Uh, X-ray is going in all the all the direction, but the detector is only uh, the collection angle is only limited to this small region. So you only collect a few percent percent of the signal. For energy loss electrons, because they are forward scattered to relatively small angles, so if you put a detector below the sample, even with a few degree collection angle a vast majority of electrons can be collected. So the problem with the light elements for EDS is low fluorescence yield. Light elements do not generate a lot of X-rays. Instead, they generate a lot of OG electrons during the relaxation process. For example, over here, when Z, atomic number Z is equal to 32, that's germanium, so the fluorescence yield is 50% for X-ray K-line. It falls to only about 2% when the Z number drops to sodium, which is 11. So energy loss electrons, however, have nothing to do with this computation. Since energy loss occurs before the relaxation of the atom. So it is before the generation of X-rays or OG electrons. So regarding the energy resolution, so here is a comparison of energy resolution with, of EDS with other complementary techniques like XPS and EOS. So you can see from EDS peaks, uh, from the, uh, the plots, EDS peaks are much wider comparing to the peaks of XPS and EOS. So this is just another example contrasting the resolution difference. So now let's switch gear and talk about EOS. So when doing EOS, we analyze the energy distribution of electrons that have passed through the TEM sample. So we know we can separate a white light into a rainbow by using triangle, uh, triangle glass prism. For electrons, the idea is the same, but we use a magnetic prism. So electrons with different energy passing through the magnetic prism will be bent to different angles and therefore form a spectrum. So the idea is pretty simple, but in reality, a spectrometer is pretty complicated. It looks like just another TEM column. In this configuration is horizontal. Uh, it has many lenses, uh, like quadrupoles, he uh, hexapoles, uh, with many sigmeters, deflectors, and apertures, and a slit. So th the example shown here is the Gatan image filter. It's a little bit early generation. It has many lenses uh, to correct the aberrations. 
So in this configuration, it's, it's called post energy, post column energy filter. So it is placed below the TEM column. There's also another kind of design, so it's called in column filter. It's integrated into the column and placed between the intermediate lens and the project lens of the TEM column. It's named according to the shape of the electron path. For example, the omega filter here has an omega kind of geometry. It uses multiple magnetic prisms to disperse and deflect the electrons out of the column then bring it back again. Because of the symmetry of this omega filter, it has some advantages. So the aberrations of the magnetic prisms could cancel out each other if they are very well aligned. So you, you don't need a lot of multipoles like quadrupoles, hexapoles to correct the aberrations and the stigmatism. So this is also, uh, there's also a third type of design which utilizes a wind filter. In this case, you have uh, electrical field and magnetic field Cursed and perpendicular to each other, then it's again perpendicular to the electron beam. So the, it's designed the, uh, such that the magnetic field, uh, magnetic force, and electrostatic force are, perpend uh, are opposite to each other in, in different directions, in opposite directions. So by carefully adjusting the parameters, electrons parallel to the op optical axis with a specific energy and travel down column straight because of the zero net force. So in that way, electrons traveling at an angle or with different energies will be deflected. In this way, the electrons with different energies will be uh, spread into a spectrum. So in fact, this is also the kind of design uh, for some monochromator. Uh, this is exact, exactly the design for our Themis Z monochromator uh, in our TEM. So there are three uh, TEMs at MRL that are equipped with EDS and EOS system. So the SEMIS Z is the newest STEM TEM equipped with the second generation probe corrector and Super X EDS system. And GATAN quantum ER image filter and ultrafast uh, dual EOS system. The Joel 10200 FS is a little older STEM TEM with the first generation probe correction. It's equipped with an older um, but larger area Oxford EDS silly detector system. Uh, it has an in-column energy filter. So the Hitachi 9500 dynamic uh, and the environmental TEM is a STEM, is a TEM without STEM mode. So it is equipped with a GATAN K2 camera for direct electron detection. And the GATAN image filter based on the K2 camera. There's EOS and um, EOS spectroscopy and the image filter for imaging. It has both image uh, in situ mode and counting mode for, for low speed and high signal background ratio. So now let's take a look at an example of EOS spectrum. So this, this sample is nickel oxide. So the whole uh, spectrum is plotted here in, as a, in a linear scale in vertical, in the vertical axis. So basically you can see there's a zero loss peak, there's a plasma peak. That's pretty much it in this uh, plot. So if you plot the spectrum in log scale, we can see many more details. So we still see the low loss regime, zero loss, plasma loss, but we can also see much more details. So we can see the, uh, the more peaks in the high energy loss regime. So I want to explain these features later, but for now I want to bring several aspects of the, uh, um, of the spectrum to your attention. So first, the peak appears, the peaks appear as small edges sitting on the high background. And also the background in the EOS spectroscopy spectrum falls rapidly with energy. Also, the intensity of the, of the entire spectrum goes across many orders of magnitude. In fact, the higher background and, and rapid decay of the signal is something we have to deal with in both experiments and post-processing. So the rapid decay of signal requires a high energy range of camera to record a large energy range. 
So in reality, we normally can only collect the small energy range at a time. For example, we collect the low loss and high energy loss spectrum separately, shown here as the low loss spectrum. With the raw data on the top with the integrated profile below. So the second one here is the core loss regime uh, spectrum. It takes about 100 times longer to acquire this spectrum to get this level of intensity. So basically, if you want to acquire both low loss and high loss regimes um, together, ideally we need a dual your system. That is what we have on our Samus ZTM system. With the dual EOS, we can collect two ranges in parallel. Also, you can correct any energy or uh, any energy drift that might occur because you have zero loss as a, as a reference. So in this slide, I will compare the, uh, the spectrum with the energy level diagram of the material. So the enormous zero loss peak is from the electrons that didn't lose any energy. So the sharpness of this peak indicates the energy resolution of the spectrometer, which is typically one to two EV, uh, depending on the electron source. So lab six electron source has about two EV electron energy re resolution. If you have monochromated electron source, the resolution could reach about 150 milli EV, like our famous TEM system. So the zero loss peak is what we uh, use for TEM imaging but it is mostly a problem for spectroscopy. It is too intense and may damage the camera. So the plasma peak comes from the interaction of the incident electrons with, uh, with the weakly bound aftershell electrons. So especially valence band electrons, just below the Fermi level. It's typically located at five to 30 EV energy position. It is a source of chromatic aberration that limits the image resolution uh, for the uh, TM mode, but can be removed with the image filter. So our interest for chemical analysis is mostly on the high energy regime. The higher energy features come from the ionization of the inner shells. So the onset position of these uh, edges uh, is controlled by the energy levels of the inner shells, for example, oxygen K, nickel L over here, so which is specific to the elements. So the detailed shape or the appearance of this uh, edge peaks uh, is called the near edge fine structure, which is related to the, uh, to the chemical state and the chemical bonding. So the energy level is a key factor to consider in your uh, experiment. So it is controlled by the distance of the inner shell to the nucleus. Closer to the nucleus, higher the energy level, basically higher the binding energy. Higher energy is needed to ionize the uh, atom. It is also a function of atomic number. For the same family of inner shells, it increases drastically with the atomic number. So higher the energy, uh, the higher energy level, however, is a problem because the rapid decay of the uh, yield signal with the energy uh, increase. So it is hard to get enough signal at the higher energy levels, such as energy higher than two keV. So the edges we can use are pretty much limited to a low energy regime, which, which is highlighted over this very narrow strip. So for heavy elements, we have to move to outer shells like L and M, or even further out to electron shells. So this periodic table summarizes the edges suitable for EOS analysis for all the elements. I'd like to point out that EOS works extremely well with the light elements because it's not only affected by the fluorescence yield of the, uh, it's not influenced by the fluorescence yield of the elements. So it's EOS is highly complementary to EDS techniques. So in the next, I will take this 3D transition metal group, group of elements uh, and as an example to see what we can do with EOS. So this chart shows the L23 ionization edges of the 3D transition metals. It clearly shows the uh, shift um, in the energy uh, in the position of these peaks uh, along the x-axis, that's the energy axis. 
So the elemental shift of the energy position of these edges can be used for the fingerprinting of the elements. And also the near edge fine structure, the detailed appearance like the spikes over here. Um, so here they are called white lines for this specific element uh, group of elements because they appear as uh, white sharp lines in the raw spectrum. So this fine structure is related to the bonding and the chemical states. So EOS can be used for fingerprinting of the chemical states. So to better understand this, let's take a step back to look at the electron transition. Assume we have simple, a simple case. So with only one isolated hydrogen atom, so no other atoms around, no outer shells, no bonding. So when ionized, all the, all the ejected electrons will jump into the vacuum level. So we should see a very sharp rise of the, of the spectrum at the, critical, at the critical ionization energy. So then it should gradually decrease again as the, pro as the probability of high energy uh, transfer is lower. So in reality, we have a solid material. So not all the inner shells, electrons rejected will go to in a uh, high vacuum. So, but will be ending uh, in the empty states of the solid material. So the fine structure basically is a plot of the unoccupied density of empty states. So which is a reflection of the bonding and the valence states. So coming back to the 3D transition metal case, the white lines are corresponding to the transition of 2p electrons in these materials, in these elements to the partial unfilled 3D states. So we can see from this table, the 3D bands are not fully occupied, except for the copper and zinc case. In copper and zinc, the 3D electrons are fully, so you have, as you see the 10 electrons in the 3D bands. That means they are fully uh, occupied. So there's no 2P electrons to jump into 3D unoccupied bands. So there's no white lines. However, if you look at the oxide of copper, the white lines show up again. So this is because in the oxide, oxygen removes the electrons from the 3D band of copper. So we get those unfilled states, unfilled bands again. So the inner shell electrons, the 2p electrons now can jump into those 3D unoccupied states. So therefore we can get the white lines back. So another example here is the titanium 2,3 edges. We can see here in case of titanium 4 plus, uh, that's the case of TiO2, each of the L2 and L3 peaks are uh, split into two sub peaks. Why in the case of titanium-3, for example, in titanium nitride, you don't see the peak split. So this indicates the EOC is a powerful tool for fingerprinting the chemical states uh, at the high spatial resolution level. So if you want to do elemental mapping or quantitative elemental analysis, we use the integrated um, intensity from the ionization edges. So this is similar to the EDS analysis. When you do EDS, you calculate the relative concentration of different elements by comparing the intensity of their EDS peaks. For EOS, we compare the cross-section intensity and cross-section of the ionization edges of different elements. So we need to remove the background because there is a huge background to, retract, to extract the edge intensity um, to, to do the calculation. So the, uh, removing the background, however, is getting pretty straightforward these days, especially with the new DMS3 software, uh, software available. Katan is doing a better job nowadays. So let's look at an example over here. So this is the simplest case of EOS mapping. Basically, it's, uh, it's a line scan. So this sample is STO again. So a series of uh, spectral taken along this red vertical line passing through six titanium uh, atomic columns. So I got 50 spectrum along the line in the vertical direction. 
Um, for now, our interest is, is focused on this titanium 2 3 edge. So, after removing the background, I display the spectra in the temperature mode. Now we got four hot vertical lines. So, each hot vertical profile is a line scan using the um, one of these sub peaks in the titanium L23 edge. So, this very tiny sub peak is, is a figure printing of the uh, elemental states chemical states, basically these vertical hot lines are the line scans of the uh, chemical states. So this is a line scan of titanium for or chemical states, basically. So it has, you can see, it has atomic resolution over here. This is another example of atomic yield mapping of the uh, barium titanate and strontium titanate interface. You can see the atomically sharp maps of different elements, the very clean and sharp, neat uh, maps. So we have mentioned so far the two ways of building the spectrum imaging data set. You can do pixel by pixel in STEM mode and uh, layer by layer in TEM mode. So we have uh, showed the example, shown the examples in the STEM mode, but let's uh, discuss a little bit the TEM mode now. Uh, in TM mode, we also call energy filter TM mode or FTM mode. So basically, if you want to build a full data set in FTM mode, you need to do many layers using many small energy windows. However, you, uh, you can also take only one layer or a few layers, which may be enough, uh, maybe give you uh, enough information for what you need. Let's see how it works. Basically, in F10 mode, we use a parallel uh, beam to illuminate the sample. We use a slit in the spectrum plane to select electrons of certain energy. And only allow uh, those electrons of certain energy to pass through to, and reach the camera. So we put the spectrometry in the image mode so we can record the F10 image on the camera. And the uptime image is formed only from those electrons of that of certain specific energy loss. So this is very similar to the uh, anal analogous to the dark, uh, dark field TM imaging technique. In a dark field TM imaging, you have um, objective lens that have back focal plane of the objective lens. There is this uh, diffraction pattern on the back focal plane. So you can use objective lens aperture to select the uh, diffraction spot to let the diffraction spot pass through the um, intermediate lens to reach the uh, uh, reach the camera. And you put the camera in the image mode, you can record the uh, dark field image. So this is very similar concepts. You can use both zero loss peak low loss peak or, cur or the uh, core loss edges for the F-time imaging. So we can do both imaging and diffraction. So I'm showing here two uh, examples over here. So one is the image mode, one is the diffraction mode. So the picture here are kind of foggy because of the samples are pretty thick. Uh, because we have considerable, considerable amount of zero low loss electrons. So we can use energy filter, um, to use energy selection slate to select only those low loss, zero loss peak electron and block out the low loss electrons. In, that, in this way, we get very clear, very sharp uh, energy filtered images. So for the zero loss peak imaging uh, above, we are not worried about the background. So when we choose a core loss edge for mapping, we need to deal with the background error. So in uptime mode, there are two ways to deal with the background, each with advantages and disadvantages. Uh, the three window method uh, you use, to determine and subtract the edge background using two pre-edge images. You obtain the net intensity of the edge uh, with background subtracted. And then your map intensity can be related to the absolute concentration. There's two uh, two window method. You use only one pre-edge image and one post-edge image. 
So then you, do, you don't get uh, net, net intensity, but you make a ratio between the post edge image and the pre edge image. In this way, it's considered only a qualitative mapping only. So the example shown here is from nanoparticles with cross, uh, with cross shell structure. So it is acquired with a silicon cage using three window method. So you can see the silicon is located on the, in the after shells of the nanoparticles only. I'd like to briefly mention another function of EOS that is to evaluate local sample thickness. Since a, a thicker sample generates more energy loss electrons, we can use the ratio of the zero loss electrons um, to zero loss intensity to the, to the total intensity of the spectrum. So this is the equation over here. So in a thicker sample, um, the inelastic, inelastic scattering may occur multiple times to the same group of e electrons. So therefore, in the thicker sample, you may see multiple uh, plasma peaks. They are equally spaced along the energy axis. Uh, we can do a uh, uh, thickness map in F-time mode as well. In this way, you acquire an unfiltered image as using zero loss peak, and the um, you acquire, sorry, you acquire zero loss peak and image and unfiltered image. And then you correct any spatial drift between the two images. Then you compute the thickness for each pixel in this, uh, in this image. And then you get a pixel map, a thickness map. So far, I think I pretty, pretty much covered all the basics. So I would like to compare the EDS and the EOS techniques a little bit. So for the EOS, you have better collection efficiency, close to 100% collection efficiency. For EDS, mostly you are stuck at uh, one to 5% energy collection efficiency. For EOS, you have much better energy uh, resolution. EDS, you have a uh, pretty lower, much lower energy resolution. Spatial resolution, are, uh, they are getting close nowadays, especially because of the uh, larger, larger area EDS detector available. For the chemical information, EOS technique gives you much more uh, information because of the uh, better energy resolution. For atomic number, EOS technique could be uh, good for light elements and also uh, good for uh, most of the heavy elements. For EDS, however, uh, you like to have heavy elements. For, for the sample thickness, EOS requires much uh, smaller th uh, thickness. EDS, however, requires a little bit thicker sample for a better uh, for the benefits of the uh, larger number of cones. The detection limits are getting closer. Norm normally, they are about 1.1 percent, but in, for heavy elements, in EDS cases, they are better. Um, for EOS, it's a little bit better for the transition um, transition metals. Um, could reach 0.01%. But operation, EOS is a little bit sophisticated and a little bit complicated to interpret. However, EDS is a little bit easier to use and to interpret. So here is an example coming from uh, comparing uh, the EDS, uh, STEM EDS and STEM EOS mapping of good palladium nanoparticles. This is taken from the Gatan website. You can see the EOS map gives, uh, map gives the uh, much better signal to noise ratio because of the better detection collection efficiency. EOS has higher background, which higher is manageable. You can get pretty clean results. Here is another example of comparing the STEM EDS and the STEM EOS. So from our own experiments, you can see the quality of the STEM EOS and STEM EDS maps are pretty um, comparable. So finally, I want to show an example of lighter element, which is carbon over here. So it is a char characterization of the tribo uh, tribological layer, surface layer formed on titanium heap replacement in human body. So your spectrum uh, gives us the information of the um, of the carbon uh, structure over the surface. 
we are able to determine the uh, the layer that contains uh, sp2 and sp3 uh, fraction of the carbon element. We can determine the sp2 and sp3 ratio in this surface layer. It's pretty nice. Before I close my presentation, I would like to show another cool example I saw in literature recently. It is a correlative study of good palladium nanoparticles with multiple TEM based techniques. So we have STEM EDS, uh, which shows the elemental like palladium segregation at the tips of these nanoparticles. And the uptime mapping and STEM EOS shows the plasma resonance of, at these sharp tips, which is related to the band structure and inner band transition, interband transition and are also related to the optical properties. They also have CL detector in their system. So you can see from the CL uh, spectrum imaging, uh, there's a higher lighter emission, there's a light emission uh, from the, uh, the sharp tips of the nanoparticles. So to summarize, I've talked about the imaging method. In some cases, you can use the image techniques to identify the elements uh, of heavier and lighter elements in some certain cases. I've talked about spectroscopy method like EDS and EOS. I've talked about element analysis with EDS and EOS. I've talked about the chemical states analysis for uh, EOS because of the better energy resolution. You can do spectrum imaging and mapping based on that. We can do quantification. For STEM EDS and STEM EOS, we can do um, achieve atomic scale resolution for mapping uh, and quantification based on the mapping and spectrum imaging. And for we can do chemical states mapping with STEM EOS for the, because of the better energy resolution. For the F time EOS mode, we can do mapping, but the uh, resolution of the maps are related are uh, restricted to nanometer scale. It's not quite, quite yet the atomic scale because of the aberration of the spectrometer is still uh, quite, quite a little bit hard to track. And we can do, uh, achieve contrast enhancement in the zero loss peak imaging. Uh, that we can achieve atomic resolution. Uh, EOS again is an excellent technique for light elements. So this is the end of my talk today. So this is a, um, also just a reminder, next Thursday at noon, Dr. Soros will be talking about the optical characterization. Please go ahead and register. You have uh, not registered yet. So if you have any questions I'd like to discuss with uh, staff or about your project, please contact either myself or Dr. Jim Maben or other e uh, EM staff members. Thank you so much for your attention. I'm glad to take any questions. Thanks. Thank you very much, CQ. Uh, appreciate the detail, level detail of this talk. Thanks again. First question here is for you to comment on difference between the ABF and ADF in the HAADF uh, method. So ABF basically is a um, um, bright field method is it contains the uh, phase contrast, a lot of phase contrast information. And ADF is uh, more inclined to uh, uh, elemental information. Okay. Now, another question here is about the effect of local strain in the images in STEM mode. So basically you mentioned that uh, uh, the contrast in STEM mode is related to the mass contrast, but how about if you have a local strain uh, will that affect the, the, the interpretation of the results, like give you like a wrong Z contrast, for example? Uh, the local strain uh, supposedly is very local. So it's very localized to, to a fraction of the atomic distance. So it, you can detect the, the uh, atomic position shift because of local strain, but it, it, it shouldn't influence the image. Uh, it's because it's so localized and it's very tiny normally. Okay. Uh, one more question here is referring to slide 32. Uh, how, how do you calibrate the energy for the high uh, loss region? If you do not, if you have not collected the zero loss peak, can you just use the oxygen peak in that case? 
Yeah, in this case, if you don't have zero loss peak, you can just use the, uh, uh, the characteristic uh, ionization end. So again, of course, if there's an energy shift, if you if there's a chemical states that co that uh, cause that energy shift, you are not able to correct it. In that case, if you are interested in that, you have to collect the zero loss um, after or before the uh, core loss end. Okay. Ideally, you need to do your system. Right. Uh, one more question here regarding EDS. You mentioned that for when you compare EDS with ILS, the EDS will, will be better done with a little bit thicker sample. Uh, in that case, uh, accepting the probability of having higher signals, but then how do you exclude the effects of overlaps? So the overlaps are supposedly uh, your you are meaning the overlap between different peaks. Uh, yeah. So for the overlaps, uh, we there's no uh, very effective method to deal with that. So several things you can do. First, you use a uh, high resolution mode, basically high energy resolution mode. There's different modes like high throughput mode, high resolution mode. High throughput is larger uh, using small uh, time to constant you get uh, less energy resolution with peaks. You can use high energy resolution mode, you use larger time constant, you get better energy resolution. So that's one thing you can do. If it's still overlapping, you can, now these computer programs are, you have to do processing, use some uh, dedicated programs like uh, D, uh, DTSA from, uh, from NIST probably uh, you can do better deconvolution of the peaks nowadays. Okay. Yeah. All right, one final question I have here. Let's say for the, for the point of view of the user in front of the microscope, trying to, to do, for example, take advantage of all these methods. Say, for example, a user has loaded the sample and then we have, he wants to do the IDPC and he wants to do the ADF. Uh, then maybe he wants to do EDS and EELS. How easy in modern microscopes is it in terms of switching between these different modes? Does it require a full realignment of the microscope? Uh, how, how, how easy to, to get all these methods in one single session, for example, the same sample? Yeah, nowadays, in fact, for the alignment is pretty stable and pretty convenient to, uh, to maintain. Uh, so basically, if you switch in between TEM and STEM, you need a realignment or stabilize for some time. But if, if you are not switching out of the STEM mode, you are doing the IDPC, uh, you can easily switch to the EOS, doing STEM EOS um, or EDS. But if you are do switching between F time mode and STEM EOS, STEM uh, um, spectrum imaging, that's not very convenient. You have to, I would say, better to do it uh, using one technique at uh, using one within one session. Okay. All right. So I guess that's the last question. Do you have any more comments to make? Anything else to say, CQ? Um, uh, that's pretty much it. Sorry for all the computer programs uh, being being slow. It's some computer glitch on my on my end. I finally off. Uh, it went through. Okay, good. Well, thanks everyone. Uh, if you have more questions or specific case studies that you'd like to discuss uh, with CQ, uh, you have your email there, his email list in the last page of this presentation. Again, we'll be making this uh, as a video available soon and within a day or so. Don't forget, we'll be keeping going every Thursday lunchtime next week. At noon, Dr. Julio Soares will talk about optical micro, uh, microscopy and spectroscopy. So everything you want to know about like about uh, FTIR, Raman, ellipsometry, and all that good stuff, Julie's going to cover that all again next week, noon time. Thank you very much, everyone, and uh, go safe, stay safe, and uh, see you next week. Bye-bye.